going to see a lot of pictures of today, much like the picture behind me, because that's what we see primarily when the sea turtles are coming up to surface for a breath of air. We'll see their head and mouth open. And that's because even though the sea turtles are going to spend most of their lives at sea, they will come up for air. And sometimes as frequently as every five to 20 minutes when they're being very active, other times they could rest underwater for up to five hours. They can conserve their oxygen and lower their heart rate to as low as one beat per minute. They're able to come up for air. They'll take a deep breath at the surface and sink back down. You'll notice that in this replica of a green sea turtle skull that I have, we don't have those plates, those facial scoots, but we do have the same kind of structure. We have the nose, we have eye sockets. Their eyes are very large for their size. And we have the mouth itself. And the mouth is used to take a large gulp of air, but it's also used, of course, for feeding. And the green sea turtle has one interesting part about it, and that is, you will notice that in all of my pictures, in all of these models, it's not very green. The green sea turtle is not named for the color of its shell or the color of its skin. The green sea turtle is named for the color of its insides. You see, these green sea turtles are primarily vegetarians. They're going to feed on seagrass. Well, seagrass that grows beneath the surface, usually in sandy harbors and bays. This seagrass is one of the favorite foods of the green sea turtle. They can use their mouth to kind of slice through that grass. You see how they've got this beak with fused teeth? And that allows them to really cut that seagrass or cut into their other favorite food, a jelly. I brought a sample jelly here. It's not real. It's fake. My replica jelly is a favorite food of the green sea turtles. This is a replica of the moon jellies. If you've been to the aquarium, you've probably seen or maybe even touched the moon jellies. And this replica, this was made with a standard grocery bag. So it is something that sea turtles have been known to encounter. They've been known to mistake plastic grocery bags for a jelly or for a moon jelly. And that's because they look so similar and it's so easy to make that mistake. Now our green sea turtles are coming to us from fairly far away. So they are able to travel usually underwater and come up for air periodically as they travel across the Pacific in some cases, or in our case, they're coming from a little bit further south. So let's take a look at our local sea turtles. Now, up until about 2008, scientists with the National Marine Fisheries Service, they knew that sea turtles were encountered here in Long Beach and Los Angeles areas, even all the way up the California coast. But those sea turtles were thought to be transients, just passing by maybe in a warm current or passing by on their way from one point to another. They weren't known to live here. Up until 2008, we thought that the northernmost population of green sea turtles here on this coast of the United States was found in San Diego. So not too far north from Mexico where they're known to nest and reside. One of our volunteers, a citizen scientist or community scientist, uh, he went out with his wife, Pam, and they took a look at sea turtles locally here in Long Beach. Pam and Hugh were able to take pictures of sea turtles over time. They were able to take these pictures repeatedly, again and again, every month of the year. And they discovered that there was evidence of at least some sea turtles being present here in Long Beach year round. So Pam and Hugh were the first steps to discovering a little bit more about our local population of sea turtles and our local urban wildlife. I'll use that term a lot, urban wildlife, in today's discussion. And urban wildlife is basically anything that you find that is 
not a pet, that is living with us, living alongside us. We'll talk about some of the urban wildlife you might see. We consider our green sea turtles to be part of that urban wildlife. Now, when Hugh and Pam wanted to show scientists that there were indeed a resident population of green sea turtles here, what they did was they went out and they just took time to make observations. They sat very still for a very long period of time and started to take pictures. And we'll take a look at some of those pictures and how we've applied them in just a little bit. But I want to show you where they were taking pictures. This is where we can find the green sea turtles. Have you spotted it yet? Right here, just next to me. There's a green sea turtle popping up its head. It doesn't quite look like the standard place that you would think of finding a green sea turtle. You might have been thinking of sea turtles as being in tropical areas where there are coral reefs and sandy beaches. They're certainly found there. Those have nice warm waters for them because those sea turtles, they've been around a very long time, 100 million years, and they are reptiles, so they do need warmth. They're cold-blooded creatures. They have a few things to their advantage, that thick, heavy shell, and a lot of fat, blubber, to keep them warm. These green sea turtles that we see here are found in slightly colder waters than you might picture, sometimes as cold as around 60 degrees. But there are a couple of things keeping the waters warmer. And with the Southern California Sea Turtle Monitoring Project, we are monitoring where these turtles are appearing and a little bit more about why they might be found here locally in this very urban setting. So Southern California Sea Turtle Monitoring is a project with community scientists, so people just like you, who are working with the Aquarium of the Pacific the Los Cerritos Wetlands Authority and NOAA Fisheries in order to track the local population of green sea turtles, to learn more about their habitat, learn more about their actions, and learn more about what we can do to help protect these animals. Because these are a protected species, and until recently, they were marked as endangered. The good news is their populations are starting to recover. They are still protected, they are still very threatened, but from the endangered status, they've moved up just a step to being protected. Let's take a look. Where we find our sea turtles is here in the San Gabriel River. The San Gabriel River runs right through many of your backyards if you're in Los Angeles. It is going all the way from the San Gabriel Mountains and down through Los Angeles, through Whittier, Downey, Lakewood, and Long Beach, exiting out between Long Beach and Seal Beach. You might be thinking to yourself, well, gee, I've never really seen a river here or in my backyard. Let me show you what our San Gabriel River looks like. It doesn't quite look like your typical river. That's because our local rivers were moved into channels quite a long time ago, about 1930s or so. And they were moved into channels because there was a big flood that swept through Los Angeles. It washed away much of Los Angeles and damaged many of the buildings that were in existence, washed houses away. And as a solution, we put in place these channels to help to protect Los Angeles and protect our homes, businesses, farms, surrounding cities. So you can see this channel running right behind me. And that channel is the San Gabriel River. If you go along the San Gabriel River, you are actually able to ride your bike all the way from the mountains to the ocean. And you might see some scenes like this. You might also see some urban wildlife. So I mentioned that we would talk about our urban wildlife. Here's some pictures of what you might picture if you were thinking of wildlife that you would see in your backyard or around your areas. Everything from opossums to squirrels, coyotes, birds, of course. Many birds are thriving in our backyards. And sometimes we might even see or see signs of raccoons and bats and other animals that are living in and around us. 
And we do have a great question that was texted in by Mia that I want to take a moment to talk about. Asking, what is the evidence that turtles have been around since the dinosaurs? That's an amazing question. And there's a lot of research that goes into where animals evolve from, how they enter kind of what they are today. And one of the things that we can study are the bones and the fossils of those animals. So I'm just going to come back in. If you go to the next slide, we'll have a sea turtle there. So it's a little more appropriate. I'll come back in with the sea turtle shell. Now, I mentioned the front of it, the scutes and the plates, and showed you the underside. You can see these bones here. Now, scientists and paleontologists have found fossilized versions of sea turtle bones and even pieces of their shells, evidence of sea turtles that lived a very long time ago. And they found those in the fossil records up to over 100 million years ago. In fact, not only were there sea turtles, but there were giant sea turtles. I mean, you were kind of expecting that, right? If we're talking about dinosaurs, you've got very large versions of animals as well. Well, we don't have giant sea turtles anymore. Well, with one exception. I can't show you the shell of this sea turtle, but I can show you its skull. This sea turtle is far, far larger than me or you or anyone you know. This is another local sea turtle. It's called the leatherback. I can't show you the shell because, as you probably guessed from the name, the leatherback doesn't really have a shell. It has this leathery adaptation. Its back is not protected by a shell, but it is protected by a streamlined series of ridges. The leatherback will travel across the Pacific, and it can also travel in a very interesting way to great depths. It can travel down deep. Now, another great question that we can find an answer to in these bones. What did sea turtles evolve from? Well, sea turtles live in the ocean now, but they didn't always. Sea turtles have a common ancestor with land turtles, and they spent time on land, breathing air, laying their eggs. They do still come up on land to lay their eggs. And living on land until some point in their history, they branched off from the land turtles and moved into being completely adapted to living in the ocean. So much so that many sea turtles do not leave the ocean unless they are coming up on land to lay eggs. Now, if you're doing the math there, that means that if you're a male sea turtle, you might live your entire life in the ocean. There are some that will come up on land to sun themselves, to sunbathe. They like a warm sandy beach as much as the rest of us, but for the most part, sea turtles are going to spend the majority of their life in the ocean, which is probably fairly good for them, seeing as they weigh a lot. You probably saw as I was holding that shell, it was pretty heavy. Actual sea turtle can get much, much heavier. Many of the larger sea turtles and uh, one that would fit in that shell, for instance, weigh well over 100 pounds, upwards of 200 to 300 pounds if you're talking about a green sea turtle, and much, much more if you're talking about the leatherback. So let's come back to those green sea turtles and the San Gabriel River. You might be wondering where these sea turtles are living when they're living in a river. Well, that's one of the interesting parts of a river. A river is not just the streams and creeks and areas that you might see in the mountains. And it's not that just that channel that you might see in your backyard if you're here in Los Angeles, but it is an entire water flow that goes down into the ocean. And it's this area down here that we're talking about. In this lower area where the river meets the ocean, we stop getting completely fresh water. The ocean water comes up into the river and we get a mix of salt and fresh water. That's usually called brackish water. These might be termed areas like estuaries or wetlands. And these are important habitats for all kinds of animals, including sea turtles. 
these areas that are close to the ocean where the fresh water is mixing in are areas where you can find all kinds of juvenile animals, all kinds of animals that are starting to grow up. And we even find that with our sea turtles in the San Gabriel River. So let's take a minute and let's see where these sea turtles are coming from before they come to us. Because when we see them, they're probably between five to 50 or more years old. They don't start off here in Long Beach or even in California. This population is coming from Mexico. They swim all the way up from areas like Michoacan, where there are about 1,400 annual nesting females per year. And we're seeing a lot of progress with these animals increasing. A lot of this progress is because of work done by the Mexican and United States governments in order to protect the sea turtles, to prevent the poaching of eggs, to prevent the hunting of sea turtles, and even to protect and prevent sea turtles from being entangled in fishing nets. So making sure that we have more sustainable fishing while at the same time making sure that the sea turtles are able to travel far and wide. Because as you can see, even our local population travels a very long distance swimming when they're very small. I've been using my model sea turtle, but it's pretty close to the size of one of these sea turtles that might be heading up. In Lo Long Beach area, the smallest sea turtle that I have seen and many of us have seen is about the size of a piece of notebook paper. So just a little bit bigger than this guy. That means that from the time it hatched, when it was about this big, to the time it was about this big, to the time it grew to be about the size of a page of paper, that sea turtle traveled all the way up from Mexico to Long Beach. It swam. How do we know this? We know this because the scientists at the uh, National Marine Fisheries Service, and part of NOAA, they have done some genetic testing on these sea turtles. They've taken small samples and they've compared their DNA to those nesting populations down in Mexico. So, these green sea turtles travel all the way up so that we can see them. Let's take a look at how easy it is to see them here in Long Beach. Ready? Are you ready to be a citizen scientist? Look closely. I made this easy. I didn't use a video. It's a still picture. I promise you there is a sea turtle in this picture. Have you seen it yet? I think a few of you have seen it. Ready? Right? There. Right there. That little blip in the water is a sea turtle surfacing for air. Let's try another one. Let's make it a little bit easier. There we go. Now you can see that sea turtle surfacing. It doesn't quite look as clear as some of those pictures taken with a zoom lens, but you can see it right here in the center, in the center of that river channel. You can see the rocks that are on either side and the plants that are growing out of it. These are part of the levees that are protecting our city, and they are part of our San Gabriel River at this point in time. The good news is there are a lot of people working to make this river a little more like a river. And you can be a part of that. You can help to talk to people and engage about our rivers and about what they look like. I wanted to share with you what it looks like when we are looking for sea turtles. Here are three of our citizen scientists who are looking for sea turtles in the river. They do this for about 30 minutes. We do it once a month, and we are stationed across the river at various intervals. We are watching two key areas. We are watching areas where water is flowing in and out of the river, what we call an outflow. And we are also watching areas in between those outflows. We have 10 stations total, and they're divided up into areas where we are watching on those outflows and areas where we are not. Now, we gather data and sometimes even pictures, and then we analyze that data because it can tell us more about the sea turtles themselves. I want to point out that sometimes the data is zero. So all of these lines are the different stations, the different locations that we are looking at and looking for sea turtles. 
and they are the number of times we spot a turtle's head popping up. Every time you spot a turtle's head popping up does not mean that you've spotted a different turtle. So you might spot the same turtle coming up for air again and again and again. That might tell us that the turtle's working really hard. It's breathing hard. It needs to come up a lot. So that tells us there's a lot of activity going on. Sometimes you don't spot any turtles. If you look at the dark blue line at the bottom, station one, you can see between January and March, so February, there was a zero. Zero is an important data point as well. It tells us there wasn't much activity going on in that area at that time. But I want you to take a look at that gray line there. That gray line is very interesting because when we first started coming out to look for sea turtles, we thought that they would have the most activity near the outflows of the power plants. Like I said, there are areas where water is coming into the river. That water coming into the river from the power plants is warmer than the rest of the river. That seems like a great benefit for a sea turtle because it's going to need that warmer water as a reptile in order to maintain its level of activity. What we actually found through our observations was there was a different point where the sea turtles were most active. The sea turtles are most active at the outflow for the wetlands. There is a small wetlands that's undergoing restoration here by where we see our green sea turtles. This wetlands habitat has seagrass and it also has many other things that are growing because the turtles that we see are juveniles between five and 50 years old and they're mostly eating things that are not seagrass. They're gonna be omnivores and they're going to eat things like invertebrates and fish and they seem to have their most activity, which might mean the most food availability right there by the wetlands. If we look at the next slide, I just want to show you, if you're wondering if this data is accurate, we actually tested that. We took a look at the data quality, how accurate our citizen scientists were. We discovered they were at least as accurate, if not more accurate, than trained scientists who were looking at videos of the same location. So it really does help to have individuals out there watching so we can gather up this very important data. And it also helps because it contributes to the conservation of sea turtles. Part of our conservation work is getting an idea of how many sea turtles there might be. When we first started, we thought maybe there were just a few transients. Now, with our observations from citizen scientists and some citizen scientists who are working on photo identification, we're able to show that there are many, many more sea turtles that are found locally. We use something called photo identification. And if you learned about our whale photo ID program earlier, you might know that we can take pictures of animals and match their markings, like matching a fingerprint. Let's see if you can match up two sea turtles. Oh, a little too far. There we go. So we have an assortment of sea turtles here. Some of these match and some of them don't. I want to show you this picture right here does match this picture over here. They were taken by two different photographers. They were taken a couple of years apart and they show us that this same sea turtle has been here in the river. We can match based on the facial scoots, these plates that we see here. And these facial scoots will match for some sea turtles, but not so much for others if you look at this guy over here. So you can see the difference in that far corner there. Have you spotted the big patch that allows us to identify this one sea turtle across the three photos and show that it's different from the others? We're able to do that more easily on some turtles and less easily on others. We don't rely on manual matching. What we do is we use a program, we use a computer algorithm to do facial recognition on the sea turtles. It will match these different points and give us some suggestions that our volunteers will then confirm and match individuals to. This helps us get an idea of what kind of sea turtles and how many sea turtles we really have here in the river. But the most important part of the citizen and community science is the people. We have 
many volunteers, hundreds of volunteers who are out there once a month helping us out and helping to identify and monitor these sea turtles. These volunteers are also contributing to sea turtle conservation. They are helping us to report if there is any entanglement. They're helping us to educate others and to spread awareness because they are seeing the sea turtles along a very popular bicycle path. And the more people we have with eyes on the sea turtles, the more we can tell if there is a sea turtle in trouble. If there's a sea turtle in trouble, we've actually placed signs along the river that tell you who to report an injured or entangled turtle to. They also have warnings about what might happen if a sea turtle is accidentally entangled in fishing gear. So you can use these good practices if you're ever fishing in the ocean to watch out for green sea turtles or any type of sea turtles to make sure that they are safe and protected. The Pacific green sea turtle is protected under state and federal law. So it's very important that you're not coming near them it's hard to come near them in the river, but sometimes we do have instances where a sea turtle is reported as entangled in fishing line. And in those cases, if you call that phone number, the Aquarium of the Pacific works in partnership with the National Marine Fisheries Service and other organizations to help to rescue, rehabilitate, and hopefully release these sea turtles. This is a photograph from our most recent release. This sea turtle was actually captured and tagged very close to the San Gabriel River five years before she was caught in fishing line and captured again, this time in order to disentangle her, to remove fishing hook from her and release her again into the ocean. A really interesting point on that, it was one of our aquarium staff who was one of the first to see and report this entangled sea turtle. So it's very important to have those eyes out there and make sure that we are able to help bring back these populations of sea turtles. Now there's something else that you can do. You can support wetlands rehabilitation and wild spaces in general for urban wildlife like our sea turtles. This is a, a picture of the Los Cerritos wetlands and the Los Cerritos wetlands is a amazing place where they are working to restore this urban wildlife sanctuary. So I hope that you will take a look at the Los Cerritos wetlands and maybe join us when we resume our wetlands restoration projects on the first Saturdays of the month. You can also get involved yourself in community and citizen science. You don't have to be a certain age, look a certain way, or even have a certain background. You can be involved no matter who you are and no matter where you are. I want to give you some ideas for how you can be involved yourself in community science right now, starting today and starting in your backyard. Here are three projects that you could get started with today if you'd like to. One, frog watch. Listen for frogs. Look for frogs in your backyard, in and around your neighborhood. They are everywhere, at least they should be. So take some time tonight to see if you can hear any frogs and report that back at Frog Watch USA. We can also take a look at the slugs and snails and other slimy things in our backyard. Project Slime from the Natural History Museum is in full effect right now. They want to know what kind of snails and slugs you can find and discover right around your own house. Take a look at nhm.org. And finally, the Monarch Joint Venture. Track monarch butterflies, eggs and caterpillars. Keep track of them nationwide. They are so important to our own gardens and everything that we do. And they're beautiful to look at. So you can look at monarchjointventure.org and report the butterflies that you see around your house. You can also volunteer online. There are a number of different websites and here are three of them for you. Zooniverse, sitsci.org, 
and SciStarter.org have projects that you can work on online, ranging from helping with disease management to tracking stars in the universe. Check out these websites if you're interested in volunteering virtually as a community scientist. And of course, check out our website at the Aquarium of the Pacific or go to aquariumvolunteers.org if you are interested in more information about becoming a citizen scientist with us and following community science that we are conducting. Now, I know you have a couple of questions for me, and I want to see if I can answer some of those questions. One of the questions was, how big are leatherback sea turtles? Leatherback sea turtles are ginormous. They are bigger than people, about 8 to 10 feet long, and they are found right here off the coast of California. Another sea turtle that you can find off the coast of California that one of you texted in about is the hawksbill sea turtle. Do hawksbill sea turtles come to Los Angeles? Yes, we have absolutely spotted them. We've spotted them from our boats, and we may have spotted one in the river, but they're not residents. They're not staying here year round. One of the really interesting things we found with the green sea turtles is that they are staying here year round, and we are finding them month after month, year after year, here in Long Beach and Los Angeles. So those are some amazing questions about sea turtles, and I can't wait to hear more questions from you. Don't forget to email your questions to live at lbaop.org. Again, that's live at lbaop.org. We would love to hear your questions about sea turtles, community science, or just hear what you're getting involved in as you explore today. Thanks so much for joining us, and I hope you are having a wonderful day here at the aquarium. We're doing great.